Welcome to Landmarks. France's most famous icon is a magnet for daredevils. The London Eye has tourists in a whirl. Journey to the roof of the world. The story behind the Berlin Wall. And a mogul emperor's opulent ode to his wife. Since 1889, this grand iron building has dominated the Paris skyline. The Eiffel Tower was named after its designer, Gustave Eiffel, and built as the entrance arch for the World's Fair that marked the French Revolution's centenary. It's the most visited paid monument on Earth and France's most recognisable landmark. As well as making an impressive backdrop to the city's many cultural events, the tower has become the focal point for numerous activities, from marriage proposals to modelling shoots and sporting activities. Symbol of Paris, of France, everybody knows, everyone. And this is the first thing you're coming to see when you're in Paris. So, And it's look very beautiful and it's going to be always modern and never going to get old. It's always amazing. But at 324 metres and two and a half million rivets, improvements to the Eiffel Tower need to be on a pretty big scale. When authorities decided to light up the tower with 20,000 bulbs, they had to enlist a team of 35 professional mountain climbers to install the wiring and connections. Because of the danger of dangling hundreds of metres in the air, safety nets and 10,000 square metres of lifelines were installed to protect the climbers during their high wire tasks. The lights were first set up for Millennium Celebrations in 2000 and were such a success, they've been made permanent. Secured by 40 kilometres of cabling, the lights now blink for 10 minutes at the start of every hour, from dusk to the early hours of the morning. OK, now, here we go. But not all Eiffel Tower hijinks are authorised. In 2006, a base jumper illegally jumped from the structure and recorded the event with a tiny video camera attached to his helmet. Belgian thrill-seeker Johan Vervoort entered the tower with a hidden parachute, bypassing the elaborate safety measures and climbing to just below the top before taking the plunge. The wide base of the tower makes jumping from it extremely dangerous. The year before, a Norwegian base jumper died when his parachute snagged on its metal surface. And in 1912, Franz Reichel, an Austrian tailor, was killed leaping from the first deck to test a tent-like parachute coat he had invented. Fortunately, Vervoort had better luck, opening his parachute safely and drifting gently down to the tower lawn. He found it an exhilarating experience. <laughs> also exhilarating is the opportunity to be part of the Eiffel's winter wonderland during the colder months. Every December, a 220 square metre ice skating rink is constructed on the first floor of the tower. The aim of the skating experience is to bring more locals to the city's chief attraction, as Parisians currently make up only 10% of the tower's annual visitors. The charge for skating is included in the tower pass, and those who've tried the experience say it's like skating on air. It is absolutely magic to be able to skate above Paris. It is true that for some years skating has been in fashion in Paris and other large cities. There's a ring at the town hall and another one at Montparnasse. Then last year we asked ourselves, why not have one at the Eiffel Tower as well? And in that case we chose to have it above Paris. It is such a dream to be able to skate while watching the capital city. The success was such last year that we decided to do it again for this season. The sight of skaters gliding around his tower would have astonished Gustav Eiffel, who died in 1923. Then again, he would probably be amazed to see the structure still standing, as he thought it was only going to be a temporary addition to the Parisian horizon. But from the beginning of its existence, the Eiffel Tower proved to be a major drawcard. By the end of 1889, the year of its completion, 
More than two million people had come to marvel at the amazing design. Now the idea of Paris without the Eiffel Tower is as unthinkable as caviar without champagne. Coming up, the Taj Mahal. India's Taj Mahal is one of the world's most unforgettable sites. For nearly 400 years, it's enchanted visitors to the city of Agra with its marble domes and exquisite proportions. There's some dispute over who designed the famous landmark, with 17th century architect Ustad Ahmad Lahari the most likely candidate. The Taj Mahal is generally considered the finest example of Mughal architecture, a style that combines elements of Persian, Turkish, Indian and Islamic architectural styles. The beautiful building was actually commissioned as a mausoleum by a grief-stricken Shah Jahan, following the death of his wife. Shah Jahan was the fifth Mughal ruler, with a kingdom extending across the Indian subcontinent. Mughal architecture blossomed under his rule, and he erected many magnificent monuments. Jahan's military campaigns were often unsuccessful, but arts and literature flourished in his kingdom, frequently used as propaganda to express state ideologies. He also supported the emergence of large centres of commerce and craft, and moved the Mughal capital from Agra to Delhi. Jahan married Mumtaz Mahal, his third wife, in 1612, and she quickly became his favourite. Famed for her beauty, gracefulness and compassion, the Queen was a big influence on her husband, encouraging him to help the poor and destitute. But the Shah was devastated when his wife died giving birth to their 14th child in 1631. Legend has it that on her deathbed, she requested a monument to their love, so he commissioned one of the most beautiful buildings the world has ever seen. That he loved her so much that he built this giant tomb for her, I think it's, it's beautiful. And according to the book, that he mourned for two years in terrible grief, and then built her this. So I think it's a great love story. The mausoleum took 20,000 people more than 22 years to build. Every day, some 10 to 15,000 people file past its immaculately manicured lawns. And before the end of the tour, they join celebrities like Princess Diana and Bill Clinton, who've been photographed on the marble bench. Uh, well, it's not my first time to India, but uh, I, every time I come, I come to see the Taj Mahal. I think, you know, if a person comes to India and they don't see the Taj Mahal, it's like, why do you go to India? And tourists from all over the world do come to see the Taj Mahal, but a cloud is hanging over the monument's future. Although authorities have made attempts in the past to keep the area around the Taj Mahal pollution-free, the surface of the onion-domed monument has become yellow over the years. Taj is yellowing, and there are three major causes for that. First is the automobile pollution, Second is the cremation ground next to it. Third is fuel combustion in Agra. And the fourth cause is the existence of polluting industries in the densely populated area of Agra. But this isn't the first time the Taj Mahal has been in need of repair. By the 19th century, the building had started to crumble. And under the Raj, British soldiers and administrators chiseled precious stones out of the marble work defacing some of the intricate designs. During World War II, scaffolding was built around it in anticipation of a German air raid. Fortunately, the building was not bombed, so Shah Jahan's monument to his beloved can still be admired by the world as he intended. When speaking of landmarks, they come no bigger nor greater than this one. Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on planet Earth. Revered by all who see it, Everest stands 8,048 metres tall, or 29,029 feet, 
and straddles both the ancient kingdoms of Nepal and Tibet. Its status as the roof of the world heightened the desire of many to conquer its peak. When asked why he wanted to make the climb, George Mallory, who was later to perish on its summit, said, because it's there. So when New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa guide Tenzing Norgay completed the once thought impossible by reaching a summit in 1953, their feet captured the imagination of the world and made them heroes. Their success changed the lives of many, including the native Sherpas who have lived below the shadows of Everest for centuries. Nearly 30,000 tourists now visit Nepal every year. In Nepal, where most of the people are subsistence farmers, the annual income per capita is about 1,500 US dollars a year. Sherpas who work in the tourism industry can earn five times as much. As a result, Sherpas now do less of the heavy lifting on the trail. A Sherpa will organise and lead the trek, but the bulky gear is usually carried by a less well-paid porter. Their strength, experience, calm and congenial demeanour make them ideal companions for climbers. Many tourists say it still seems like hard work by Western standards. Uh, it's very really hard to become a guide, actually. Uh, we, should, we should do lots of struggle, like we have to carry a heavy load as a porter. We should do as a porter as well at, at the beginning of the job, you know. But for many of the Sherpa people, it's a way of life regarded as a gift from the gods. So Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Sherpas own most of the 400 plus lodges in the Khumbu region, where Mount Everest stands, and many of the companies that organise the treks in Kathmandu. Many villagers in Khumbu enjoy some of the modern conveniences made possible by the Sherpas' success. Growth in the region has not only improved the standard of living in many villages, but it has helped commerce flourish. Sherpas walk for days from many different villages in the south up to Namche Bazaar, a prosperous Sherpa village, an important trading centre for the Saturday market. There is concern that as Sherpas leave Khumbu for even better opportunities, they will leave part of their culture behind as well. A population of only about 10,000 Sherpas remains in Khumbu. In the villages, Many Sherpas still make an effort to preserve their traditions and to pass them on to younger generations. In Kumjung, villagers wearing traditional costumes hold a number of ceremonies just before the rainy season to pray for a good season for their crops and they still hold deeply religious faith which promotes the Buddhist idea of compassion for all human beings. Not far from Kumjung, prayer flags swirl in the wind gracing spectacular mountainsides nearly 30 years after they were first raised. The flags fly for the souls of over 200 climbers who have died trying to reach the summit. For many, conquering Everest is a magnificent obsession, but to others, it can also be an unforgiving reminder of the respect nature demands. Coming up, the London Eye. and the skyline is marked by London's newest drawcard. The Millennium Wheel opened in March 2000 to support and scepticism. But it only took a few months for the London Eye, as it's affectionately known, to become Britain's top tourist attraction. An army of cleaners start work at first light, giving each of the 32 capsules a thorough going over, inside and out, to ensure a smudge-free view. The result is unparalleled views of London. It's a visual experience. Uh, we've got to ensure that guests have got a good view. Our benchmark quality standard is that the capsule glass is impeccable every day. At 135 metres high, the eye is the tallest structure in London open to the public. The view is distinct and unimpeded. An uninterrupted panoramic view for 25 miles. The structure was originally designed for a Millennium Architecture competition. When the competition was scrapped, 
husband and wife team, Julia Barfield and David Marks, were so convinced of its worth, they went ahead anyway. With help from British Airways and the Two Swords Group, Barfield Marks raised the finance necessary to construct the wheel, and it was floated in sections on pontoons down the Thames. Once the modules were connected, the giant structure was raised upright by cranes at a rate of two degrees an hour until it reached 65 degrees. It was then left at that angle for a week until engineers completed the next phase. Each rotation of the eye takes 30 minutes and the wheel continues turning slowly even when visitors are getting on and off. With a circumference of 1,392 feet, the wheel would be 1.7 times longer than Britain's tallest building if it was unravelled. Each of the 32 capsules weighs 10 tonnes. We wanted the architecture and the engineering to, you know, to, to come together to create something wonderful. Yeah, but we wanted it not to be dominating, but, but light and beautiful. That, that was the, the aim, so all the time we were trying to, to pare it down so that, um, so that it appeared you know, filigree on the skyline. As the sun gets higher and the sky brighter, more people are drawn to the eye. And at the busiest time of day, crowd management strategies are needed. The London Eye has elevated close to 20 million people above London. Its busiest day saw a staggering 20,000 visitors take a ride. John Richards is one of eight customer services personnel who help visitors find their way around the eye. In the years since it opened, he's heard it all. There was a famous um, April's Fool's press release. Um, they said that the wheel would be dropped horizontally and used as a merry-go-round. And the amount of phone calls, emails, faxes, requests that, OK, we want to go on London Eye as Mario go round. So the amount of people that actually fell for it was amazing. The London Eye's popularity has already seen it featured in numerous film and television projects. In Fantastic Four, The Rise of the Silver Surfer, the superheroes prevent the wheel from toppling into the Thames. In Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, it can be seen during a chase sequence. And soap operas such as EastEnders have used the eye as a venue for wedding proposals. And it's not just television characters who see the eye's romantic potential. The capsules can be hired for special occasions, so the giant wheel's now a popular venue for weddings and anniversaries. We had nine proposals on Valentine's night up here where we had them with private capsules and a waiter with champagne and canapes. And uh, it was amazing seeing the smiling faces come off. Uh... The architects are proud of overcoming one of their most difficult engineering problems, making sure none of the eye's structure spoilt the view. Although the London Eye was meant to be temporary, the way it's been embraced by Londoners, it'll be around and around for a long time yet. Coming up, the wall that split a nation. For nearly 30 years, this was the quintessential symbol of the Cold War, a bleak dividing line between East and West. The Berlin Wall separated families and shut off West Berlin from its communist neighbours. When construction started in 1961, the East German leaders proclaimed it as an anti-fascism protection barrier, but it was widely seen in the West as a means of preventing Easterners from defecting to West Berlin. Although the war was hugely unpopular within East Germany, the isolation it brought enabled the communist leaders to assert control and stem the flow of black market goods coming in from the West. The wall stretched for 155 kilometres and evolved from a basic wire fence to a thick concrete barrier. For added security, a second wall was built 91 metres from the first and a no-man's land between them became known as the Death Strip. It was booby-trapped with trip wires, footprints could easily be seen in the gravel, and guards had a clear line of fire. 
While West German children accepted the wall as part of their lives and happily played alongside it, East Germans were not so cheerful. Although around 5,000 people successfully escaped the totalitarian state, an estimated 192 people were killed in the attempt. The wall grew to be a hated reminder of East Germany's repression. In January 1989, leader Erich Honecker declared that the wall would stand for another 100 years. Less than a year later, German authorities were forced to respond to the tide of liberalism and open the borders between East and West Germany. The mood for change came so fast it took everyone by surprise. When the East German Minister for Propaganda told a live TV press conference that people with proper permission would be allowed to travel to the West, thousands of people flocked to the checkpoints. With the East German leadership in disarray, none of the guards were prepared to use force on their fellow citizens, and they allowed thousands of people to pour through the checkpoints. Families were reunited after decades apart, and the West welcomed their Eastern brothers and sisters with open arms. The people who took to the wall with sledgehammers to carve out a piece of history and destroy the object that separated them from the world became known as wall woodpeckers. The East German military began officially demolishing the wall in June 1990 and the country was reunified four months later. Little is left of the controversial Berlin Wall, but a growing movement supports the creation of memorials to mark some of East Germany's fast forgotten history. Alexandra Hildebrand, head of the Checkpoint Charlie Museum, is adamant people should be aware of the land's past as part of the border area and that it should be marked and remembered as such. We are putting up the Berlin Wall out of protest. We want to point out that it is an historic site, Checkpoint Charlie. This is not a garbage dump. However, there are those who oppose the wall's reconstruction, believing it glorifies the totalitarian past and is not an accurate representation of what the wall looked like. I think this project is inaccurate because the wall originally was somewhere else. Also, this project looks as though the border area really only was a wall, as could be seen from Western Berlin at the time. You were able to get to it, paint on it, and a lot of tourists will be able to go up close and have their photographs taken and then go home and think that this is how it used to be. And that's not how it was at all. It was an area controlled and policed by border staff, which also means that people were shot at here, and this project does not control. Maria Nuuk is the head of the Berlin War Memorial, one of three original sections of wall still standing. This memorial at Bernau Strausser has views of the infamous Death Strip, where hundreds of Berliners were killed or injured as they attempted to escape to the west. Even though most of this landmark has been dismantled, its legacy will remain forever. Thank you.